the church. You're not just in church, you are the church. You are the people. God's people who assemble in his name, come together. We've been doing this for 2,000 years, assembling in his name, encouraging one another, even by our coming, by our attendance, by being part of it. We encourage each other. We build each other up. We allow the Spirit of God to come and move in us and move throughout the body and minister. Not only do we minister to God, but we minister through God to one another. That's what being the church is. That's the, the point God brings us together. We also worship together. We grow together. We mature together. We step in the way to encourage and build up one another. All of us experience life. We experience the trials of life, the pressures of life, the things that come to us come to the unjust and the just alike. You know, I know sometimes Christians think that they're the only ones going through the hard times. No, the world is going through hard times. Everybody's going through it. How you get through it is the thing that matters. Getting through it is the thing that matters. It's not so much he who starts the race, but he who finishes it. And that was the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul so long ago. Last week we talked about perseverance and endurance, pressing on and moving despite the resistance, despite the issues. And we need to be encouraged in this way because there's things that are happening in our world. And sometimes they come right to our doorstep. They come up to our face. It's in your face. And sometimes you don't know how to deal with it, but did you know that God has spent at least the last 7,000 years of human civilization connecting with his creation and guiding them, directing them, leading them to those who would hear, to those who would see, to, do, to those who would ask, Lord, lead me. There's an old song years ago. It's called Lead Me, Guide Me, and it says these words, Lead me, O Lord. Won't you lead me? I am lost and I need your strength and your power to guide me over my darkest hour. Lord, just open my eyes that I can see. Lead me, O oh Lord. Won't you lead me? Hallelujah. We need that leading, and God's been doing that for years. God's been reaching out to us. It's good to see you, Leah. <laughs> Not at all. Welcome home. It's good to see you, Liz, knowing all that you're going through and have been through. It's the spirit of endurance. I'm sure every one of us have got trials and setbacks and hurts and even tragedies that have happened in our lives. And you're still here. You've, you've really already learned what I'm trying to teach. So I won't so much as try to teach as much today. I will try to encourage you in that which you've already known. To press on to follow his leading, to persevere and to endure because in the end, it's worth it. We gave you an example of Jesus last week where the scripture says this, we look unto Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him he knew the end game of what was going to come as the result of what he was about to do. 
He endured the cross. He did what? He endured the cross. The most cruel, wicked form of death by execution that man has ever devised. And Jesus willingly gave his life to that, despising the shame for the joy set before him endured it for you and I. And there's something to learn in that. There's something in that lesson. And I want to bring that out today in the life of another. We talked to you about persevering and enduring. Now I want to talk to you about how we do that. How do you do that? How many have heard of Saul of Tarsus? How many have heard of the Apostle Paul? They're one and the same. <laughs> but there was a change. Because Paul was not always Paul. Was not always referred to as Paul. In his earlier days, he was Saul. And Paul, having become the Apostle Paul, or Saul having become the Apostle Paul, is perhaps the greatest example of all time of a follower of Jesus Christ who set the example of endurance and perseverance. And it's not just words written down about a man's life. It is the words that describe the trials and the difficulties and the experiences of a man's life. Before Paul's conversion, Paul was known as Saul and he was considered to be a Pharisee of Pharisees who intensely persecuted the followers of Jesus. He hated Christians. He hated them with a passion. And because it was a passion, he went after them with a passion. And he would have them put in jail and he would have them put in chains and he would have them beaten and flogged and he would have some of them killed at his feet in the name of God. Oh, he was passionate, passionately wrong and he was a persecutor of the truth. He was a persecutor of Christians. We celebrate him. We look to his example, though, because of what happened to him. After his conversion, he became the Apostle Paul. <laughs> a shocking change, a, sh a shocking transition and a transformation. He became a man on a mission or a man on a purpose. Acts 22, 6 through 10 says this. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me and I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand. That's the condition of a lot of people. Some people see the light, but they don't understand. The voice of the one who was speaking to me, they also heard. Well, they did not, they did not hear the voice. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. So I want you to understand that when Paul came into the revelation of who Jesus was and was converted, his life began to change and God gave him a glimpse of a window of what was going to happen. I have appeared to you for a purpose. You're going to bring my name before kings and, the, and Gentiles. And you're going to proclaim my name and I myself will show you, he said to him, what great things you will suffer for my name's sake. Pretty much laid it out to Paul that life is about to beget, beget it real troublesome for you, real difficult for you. You will be getting trouble. You will be getting in trouble. You will be struggling. But I'll be with you. And you will get through it. Now he gave him a full heads up. What great things you will suffer for my name's sake. 
I wish we all kind of got something like that, huh? Imagine when you first became a Christian, and besides the fact that somebody told you you were going to get a new car and a big house and live your best life, and somebody told you every day was going to be Sunday and every day was going to be roses coming up. Despite that, <laughs> imagine if someone said, well, it's good that you're a Christian because your life is about to take a serious turn and you're going to run into problems, trials, persecutions, issues that are going to come in your life. And there are going to be times that you might even despair of soul. But I'll be with you, and you'll get through it. And in the end, you'll know it was worth it. Okay. Wish we had that, and to some degree we do, but maybe not as much as Paul had gotten, because he was in for a ride. Some of you feel like you've been in for a ride yourselves. You've been going through some stuff. Of course, Paul's, however, was a high calling. It was the high calling of the apostle, and therefore it had immense purpose and thus a great opposition to which he was called to endure. Your calling, friends, and purpose also has great significance as well and will have a commensurate, understand this, amount of resistance and opposition to which you are called to endure. Let me say it again. Your calling and purpose also has great significance as well and will have a commensurate amount of resistance and opposition to which you are called to endure. In other words, you may not have to go through all the hell that the Apostle Paul went through because his was commensurate to his calling. But you will go through whatever you go through commensurate to your calling and purpose as well. Whatever that entails, it'll be commensurate in response. Jesus said, as uh, Pastor Chet said earlier, as they hated me, they're going to hate you. As they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so, to whatever degree you walk and function is going to be to the degree, because you bear his name, that you're going to get some trouble back. Amen? Amen. As a matter of fact, the Bible says all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There are some people who would say, well, I, I, I don't really have any persecution. Well, the Bible does say that all those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Well, that's funny. I never really suffer any persecution. Well, the Bible says that all those who desire to live godly <laughs> will suffer persecution. Oh, hmm. So it becomes commensurate to how you live. All right. Um, a short time later, Paul's purpose was revealed, as I've been explaining. Let's look at Acts 22, 12 through 16. It says this, And one named Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, this is uh, Paul telling his story. And standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. The reason why he needed to see, have sight is because when, he, when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, he was struck. The Bible says he fell backwards by a great light. And they heard that voice that we had mentioned. And that light blinded him for three days. He was physically blind. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. Everybody get that? Appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. This is the conversion of Saul, who became Paul. Now, we're going to jump to the life of Paul and the period of time that he went into where he suffered terrible, terrible trials and persecutions beyond nearly everything that you and I have ever known. And yet he endured. So I want you to hear these things. 
After a while, after Paul's conversion, in the beginning, there was some resistance. Some of the Jews had said, you know, you certainly can't be Saul, that guy who hated us and hated Christians and put him in jail. And so they had trouble receiving him, trouble giving him any credit for what he was doing. He truly had a miraculous conversion from his previous life, and he grew up, and he developed, and he became the great apostle. But the church didn't receive him very well. And so they persecuted him and gave him kind of the, you know how we talk about the, the welcome hand of fellowship? Well, they didn't give him that. They came, kind of gave him the hand, all right, but it was more like this. You know, I gave him the hand. And maybe they gave him other things as well, anything to keep him distant. But eventually, people begin to warn, uh, I'm sorry, warm over to him, especially as he began to defend himself. You say Paul defended himself? He not only defended himself as he developed the ministry and surpassed all the other disciples, including the ones Jesus personally trained for three and a half years in their success of spreading the gospel. They, he built churches and spread the gospel on three continents. Firstly, by himself. They started to believe him and he would defend himself in this way. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 11, 22 and 28, he was saying this of himself, are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? Well, so am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? Well, so am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. Of course, I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, however, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often death. Five times I received of the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. They had this kind of rule where if you got beaten with the lash, it would be 39 lashes because they usually thought that by the time you get to 40, you'll die. So they would stop them before they reached 40. Lashes would usually be done with something as simple as a whip of several tails of leather or it would be a scourge, something that had bits of metal and bone attached to the end and when they would wrap it around your body, it would attach to the flesh and then they would pull it off and it would literally yank pieces of flesh off your body. Jesus received the same beatings uh, in his life just before the cross. Um, so Paul is saying, how many times did that happen? Five times I got 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent adrift in the sea. I was on frequent journeys, constantly in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at the sea, danger from false brothers, in toil, in hardship, through many sleepless nights. There are times that Paul couldn't even sleep. In hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. I want you to think about what Paul went through before you complain about what you go through. We get upset when our sweat breaks over our brow because the air conditioner is not working. And we're like, oh, for days, you don't know what I'm going through. Now, I'm not trying to minimize that, but I do want you to have perspective. That's all. This guy went through living hell. Then he says this in verse 28. And apart from the other things, there is also the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Say what? My anxiety for all the churches. Now, if we've ever hit something that people experience today, you hear about people experiencing anxiety, fear, the fear of losing control, the fear of losing your mind. Yeah, this apostle struggled with all these things. 
He constantly had the weight on him about carrying the churches, how they're doing, how's it going, how are they, how are they working, are they, are they going to make it, are they going to get through, because they were going through persecutions, and he had to not only go through all his persecutions and his trials and his times in the sea and his times under the beating and under the lash, but he also had to carry the, the concern and the anxiety and the fear of the condition of all the churches that he had established. And I found this verse when I was doing this study in Acts chapter 20, and it's so neat because I realized that he said this. I I did the research and found out he said this about halfway, between halfway and three quarters of his ministry. He actually encouraged himself and others in his purpose. He drew the line to understand it. Acts 20, 24, it says this, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I might finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He encouraged himself and others by saying, I don't count my life worth anything. I've been through this now for about three quarters of my life. You could probably say this is probably about 20 years in. He ministered for about 30 years. So about 20 years in, he says, you know what? My mission is about doing what I've been called to do, finishing the race that I'm entered into, finishing the course, completing the tasks that he has put upon me. And we read about that when he said, God has desired to show you his will for your life and to set a purpose in your life and cause you to go forward into that and you're gonna go through some serious suffering. And he's like, I'm all about it. Even after he's gone through all this, he says, I just want to get it done because I don't care about my life unless it's only fulfilling his calling upon it. I want to do what I'm here to do. I want to do what I'm purposed to do. I want that to be my blood. I want that to be my my life, my matter. What's the matter with you? That's my matter. It's not about all the frills and thrills and chills. I'm a pastor, one, two, three. It's about his will for your life. I consider my life worth nothing only that I might finish the race and complete the task. Now, in the end of Paul's life, he declared his accomplished goal. He basically said he accomplished his goal. Look at at some of his last words now. Now we're jumping to the end of his life where he ended up losing his head. He said this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also all those who've longed for his appearing. So he he sums up his own life and going through the trials and enduring them, pressing on. He sums that up as equal to those who long for his appearing. You know why? Because people who are longing for Jesus' appearing, for Jesus to come, they realize they've entered into the race and that's all that matters to them, of getting through that race and knowing one day they're gonna see their king. Not only getting through the race, like I said, it's not so much about uh, starting the race, as many, too, many people step up to start the race, but they don't finish it. But getting across it is what matters finishing your race. I don't care if you're battered, beaten, and bruised. There I go again. (laughs) It doesn't matter. What, What matters is that you get across. Now, this isn't about salvation. Don't misunderstand. This is not about you getting to the end and God going, ha, you went through a lot of stuff. Now I'm gonna save you. No, you're already saved. You're saved by the blood of Jesus, what he did, your faith in that, your faith and confidence in what Jesus did at the cross. That's your salvation. But this is about getting through life, fulfilling the purpose of God for your life. Everybody say this, why am I here? Say it again, 
why am I here? That's what you're here to do, is to answer that question and apply that to your life and enter into that journey, that road. That's what matters. You say, oh, I, I hear you, brother, <laughs> but I don't know if, if it has that much value to me. Listen, listen. A hundred years from tonight, that's going to be all that mattered. Because one day we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to receive reward for the things that we endured and the experiences we gained. And the position, I know this is a little way out there, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. And the positioning that you have in heaven. Jesus talked about people who are faithful in their responsibilities will be rewarded with much one day. And those who are faithful with only so much will be rewarded only so much. And those who are faithful with more shall be rewarded with more. The condition, of course, was faithfulness. You don't have to compete with Billy Graham and, and, and be preaching to 250,000 people in the stadium every other weekend to have some kind of reward. All you have to do is be faithful what he told you to do. And then you will be rewarded if you're faithful to it. If he simply says to you, I have this one thing that I want you to accomplish. Every time you see someone come into church, I want you to smile and walk over to them and say, I love them. Go tell them I love, love them. I care about them. But that seems like so boring. They get that on Christian television all the time. God loves you. He really does. Yeah, he says, I don't want you to do it over television. I want you to do it in person. Simple task. Be an encouragement. Go, go encourage somebody. A lot of people are down nowadays, even during the holidays. Go be an encouragement. So God tells you to do that. You say, well, yeah, but that's nothing. That's everything to him. He said, if someone gives so much as a cup of cold water in my name, great will be their reward in heaven. Why? Because even the smallest tasks matter to God if that's the responsibility you've been given. So bring that on over into the area of endurance and perseverance. Accomplishing those smaller matters or whatever level matters they are at, each one of us has different levels of responsibility. Your reward intensifies based on the resistance you get to accomplish those deeds. Your reward is based on that. So, therefore, the enemy becomes empowered to stop you from succeeding and persevering to get you to quit and to give up and step aside without fulfilling your tasks, your course, so you see, it's all, it's all this big thing here. We're, we're involved in this race. And God has given each of us our own tasks. We talked a few weeks ago about stewardship. Stewardship of our time, of our talent, and our treasure. Everything that we've been given here, he owns and has given it to us and said, steward that for me and you will be greatly rewarded for it. And then he tells us, oh, by the way, you have to steward that while you're getting the wind of resistance. I can't smile at that person. I'm going through a bad day myself. Oh, is that your resistance? So that's why you can't do it? That's why you can't encourage that person that you know is down because you're down? You can't wait till you always feel good or until everything is perfect in your life before you can go encourage someone else. As a matter of fact, that's your task, is to bring your abilities, your talents, your treasures, your, your, your life's purpose is to be poured into others at whatever level God has set for you. 
You're not called to preach necessarily. I don't think, I don't know if you are. Some of you might be. I've heard some of you get up at times and give words, and I'm like, wow, that's good. That, that happens every time I hear JT get up there, you know? And he'll break open the word, and he'll start saying things and show you all these nooks and crannies in the Bible. And I'll be like, wow, man, I didn't even see that. What's up with that? Well, that's his task. That's his gift. I can tell you there were years ago that Tommy would get up before our congregation, and she would bring a word forth, and I didn't have to tell her, here's what you need to say and write it down and, you know, make sure you memorize it and all that. I didn't have to do that. She can't, because she's a very disciplined woman. When, when she gets set on something, she can do it. So she would get her own mind in it and say, oh, I'm going. I, and she'd show up and go, on, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to read some scripture and tell you what it talks about, tell you what God is saying. And she'd just bring it forth, and I'd be like, wow. You don't have to be a preacher, though, but you could be called just to give a word. Give the, the a right word, fitly given, is like apples of gold in the settings of silver. If any of you caught the word blast we sent out a couple of weeks ago, you know what I'm talking about. The, a fitly word given at the right time, man, that can just bring richness to your life. It's the work of God. Stop minimizing or thinking that you have to do some huge accomplishment when you just need to do your accomplishment. What did God call you to do? All right. So in the end, he said it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. So I would like to ask us three questions. Number one, are we fighting the good fight? Are we fighting the good fight? What is the good fight? Have you ever thought about that? What did Paul mean when he said, I have fought the good fight? Well, Here's what I have seen. The good fight is the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is your three main engagements in this world. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is the outside pressures of life. Jesus called them the cares of this life, and he said, be careful. Yes, there are cares. There are entanglements. There are involvements. There are needs and necessities you have to have in this life. But be careful. Careful now, because they can entangle you to such a place that you lose your perspective of the kingdom of God and its purpose upon your life and what you are to accomplish. So his answer to that was, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness going forth and all these other things, the cares of life that you care about so much and often put first place instead of second, God will take care of those and add them to your life. He'll be there for you. He'll provide for you. He'll meet your need if you put the kingdom first. So the world, the world is part of the good fight. Are we fighting against those tendencies? In John 16, Jesus said this, In this world you shall have tribulation or trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So while you are fighting the good fight in this world, you're going to deal with persecution, you're going to deal with ridicule, you're going to deal with attitude. How many people have found attitude with people? You know? And I'm not talking about your attitude to them, I'm talking about their attitude to you. That's the pressure. That's pressure from the world. Sometimes people don't like you. I don't even like you. No, I'm kidding. Sometimes people don't like us. And oftentimes people don't like me. You might think, oh, you're the most lovable. What do you mean? <laughs> no, I could give you a list <laughs> of people who don't like me. No, not at all. And I got to deal with that. But I don't deal with it by giving them the same thing back because I'm a Christian and I want to be Christ to them. I want to have that Christ-like attitude. I want to be the right kind of response. That's part of my endurance part of my task is to allow the molding and shaping of God to change the way I behave and the way I act. So, the good fight is fighting the world. Secondly, Mark 14, 4, 19 says, Jesus said, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things choke the word and its productiveness in us. Its productiveness in us. What does? The, the, the deceitfulness of riches 
the cares of this life and the lust of other things. Man, sometimes you and I, we are just going about chasing all these things that fulfill our craving. We're living in a craving society. My son Daniel was telling me the other day that the, the, the Generation Z is so geared, and this present time we're living, this culture is giving you everything at once, everything instant, everything at once, and therefore the temptations and the, those who fall by them today are 10 times worse and harder than at any other time in human history for people to endure. And if you are enduring under this condition and these conditions, then you've got something you are certainly enduring about. And don't think that it doesn't count or it doesn't matter, because it does. If you're finding that ability to overcome the anxieties and the pressures and the temptations and the lusts of many things happening around you, the bright lights that are beaming in your eyes. Dan told me that, that so many of our people who have cell phones are being controlled in a sense by the blue light, he called it. The blue light on your cell phone is doing things to your brain, causing lack of sleep and other issues. Because some people aren't just staring into the blue light of their phone, they're staring into the videos and the TikToks and the all the things that are out there, and they think there's no harm there. But it's stuff that can mess you up and get you off the course and stop you from success in your Christian walk. Are you listening to me today? When you're fighting, you're fighting the world. Number two, fighting the good fight is dealing with the flesh. The battle within us rages along the journey, our weaknesses. So one of the things that Paul said when he said, I fought the good fight, what did he mean by that? He said, I battle the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 says, those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You mean there's parts of me that doesn't want to serve God? Oh, yeah. A lots of parts. Some of you didn't come to church today, so I'm not talking to you, I guess. <laughs> but it may be because your flesh said, uh-uh, you don't need to be there. You've got other fish to fry, other things to do. Now, I'm not picking on anybody, but I'm just saying, for whatever the reason, the flesh fights against the Spirit. The flesh doesn't want us to walk with God. Our flesh, I'm not talking about somebody else's flesh. I'm talking about your own and mine. Look at uh, Galatians 5.17. It says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. And they're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you really want. You, you can't fulfill what you really want to do in the spirit, the good things. You want to get things accomplished. You want to get the mission done. You want to get your work done. You want to get whatever done in the kingdom. But you can't because your flesh is arguing against you. Your flesh argues and fights against your spirit and competes against it. And so that's part of the good fight is that you fight that. And you learn how to walk in the spirit as a Christian can and you learn how to overcome the flesh. Are you following? Following along? I'm not telling you anything you don't really know, right? Because you know this. You know you battle the flesh. But this is part of what Paul was talking about when he said that we are dealing with the flesh. And he said, I'm fighting the good fight. This is part of what he's talking about. He had, and despite all the resistance he was getting, despite all the resistance he was getting, he had to deal with his own flesh. He had to deal with the world and the pressures from life. Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in this world. Through much tribulation do we enter the kingdom. It goes on and on. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them through them all. We have all these things going on. And then we got to deal with our own flesh. It gets worse. What else did he mean? He said, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our adversary, one who opposes us. <laughs> it's not that I can't, that I got to go through enough stress in the world itself, and then I got to deal with my own problems of the flesh and step in the thing half the time and get myself dirty or get myself in a, in a problem from my actions, my disobediences, whatever I do. <laughs> but now you're telling me I got to fight the devil too? <laughs> and he's got some goods, meaning he's got some power. The Bible says he has weaponry against us. And if we're not realizing that, and I bet many of you do realize that, we fight spiritual forces. 
The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, we don't have to bring it up, but I'll just quote it for you. It says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, human people. That's not talking about your flesh. That's talking about flesh and blood, meaning other people. We don't wrestle against human people, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and rulers of this present darkness. That's what we wrestle with. That's what we fight with. The devil is opposed to you. He's the adversary, and he's formidable. He trips us up. He attacks us. He withstands us. Do you remember when Jesus came to uh, Simon Peter, and he said to him in Luke twenty-two thirty-one, he said, and the Lord said, to si- si- said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. There are times the enemy is trying to sift you. He's desiring to have you, have control of you. Can you endure that? Are you enduring that? Or did you get knocked out and knocked over? Now, if you did, we want to encourage you that you can still stand up. You can stand up because God's power is dwelling in you. A lot of reasons why Christians don't walk in the power of God as they could is because they don't activate that power. They don't live in that power. They kind of let the power go out like the night, like the night light going out at night. They don't realize that the residing in them is that well of life and power. The Bible says that God has given everything we need according to life and godliness, all the power we need. You can fight the devil. You can overcome him. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this, We should not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes or his plans, or his plottings, or his devices. So you understand that we fight the world, we fight the flesh, and we fight the devil. That's what the good fight is all about. And that's all I'm going to give you today. There's more, because we're going to talk about finishing the course. What did he mean by that? And keeping the faith. What did he mean by that? Because those are the three things he did. He said, I fought the good fight of faith. I have finished the course. And I have kept the faith. When you get these three things down, you'll understand your purpose. You'll understand the things that you're engaging through the trials of this life. You'll understand that God has empowered you to go through these things. And that your reward is based on your dealing with these things. According to the commensurate that comes against you. And you say, why does it have to be a fight? Why can't I just swim and enjoy life? (laughs) Well, because this life is only temporal. You can enjoy things. There are good things here in this earth. The Bible says God has given the earth unto men. And he wants us to enjoy what he has given. That's why he's made the world beautiful. But sin has come. And the world has fallen. And those who know God have been challenged to be overcomers. Paul was our amazing example. Through all the things that he fought and endured, he becomes a testimony for us to say, man, I got it bad, but not as bad as he had it. I can get through this. For there's no temptation that is beyond the commonality of man that has taken you, that God would not provide a way for you to escape and to endure it. There's no trial come upon you that you can't overcome and can't conquer. You and I come from a family of great men of God and women of God who have once started out in a very ordinary life and were beaten and attacked and faced terrible opposition. But now they have become what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, a great cloud of witnesses who've gone before us. And they're all up there. And perhaps they're looking down and they're saying, come on, you're, you, you, you can do it. You're so close. 
You could cross over now. You, you're almost so close you could roll over the line. You don't realize how strong you've been and the things that you have resisted. But don't give up. Yes, the pressures are still coming. Yes, the trials are still here. Yes, the attacks are still waging. But he has equipped you, child of God. He's equipped you with weapons that are not carnal, not fleshly, not common. But he's given you divinely powerful weapons. One of those weapons is the weapon of worship. Praising God in the midst of a difficulty. Praising God in the midst of a storm. Giving God a shout of praise when everything inside you is saying, shut your mouth. And complain. If you're going to open it, complain about something. Be like the rest of them. No, you don't have to do that. I'm not saying put a smile on your, on your face and fake it till you make it. I'm talking about getting that sense of endurance, that even that self-encouragement that Paul talked about halfway through his life. And he said, let me tell you what I'm on. Let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm on a mission. And I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm going to obey that heavenly vision. I'm going to succeed in my mission. I'm going to keep the faith. I'm going to fight the good fight. And I'm finishing the course that God has put on me. No matter what your race is, you're all in it. Whether you know it or not, and I hate to say it, whether you like it or not, you're in it. When you signed up for Jesus, you signed up for the race. And you're in it. The Bible says, run that race so as to win the prize. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about victory. I'm talking about overcoming. I'm talking about championing through. Battered, beaten, and bruised, it doesn't matter. Coming through, crossing that finish line. God who has purposed the beginning in me is going to complete it in the finalization. And I'm, I'm all game. Let's do it. Let's do this. Amen. All right, give the Lord a hand of praise. Next week we will finish with what is finishing the course and what is keeping the faith. Hallelujah. And I believe you'll be changed. Let me pray over you. Let's stand up together. Father, in Jesus' name, empower everyone right now under the sound of my voice, whether by internet or here in the sanctuary. Empower them to know they are called to be victors. They are called to be conquerors, even more than a conqueror, through Jesus Christ who loves us. Lord God, stir up their spirits and their faith in you, Lord, that you, God, will continue to lead them and guide them through the difficulties, through the trials and tribulations, giving them those places, leaping across the mountains at times, with joy unspeakable and full of glory, with victory and a flag in their hand that they post and say, the Lord has won this battle for me and I shall stand on that day. I will get through. I will not be overcome. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You take that to heart, friend. Take that to heart. Now and fill them, Father, with your spirit. For it is by your spirit that our power and our work is accomplished. 